The story of Lafleur goes back years before his birth, when his father, Abraham, served as guide and bodyguard to Sir Andrew Stockenstrom, lieutenant general of the Eastern Province. According to Griqua legend, Abraham one day saved Stockenstrom's life while being attacked by a band of Kosas. Stockenstrom then turned to Abraham and said, You are a brave man. One day, when you have a son, you must name him after me. Take this five pound note, it must be used to christen the boy. If he turns out to be a coward, you must beat him to death, because a brave man like you does not deserve a coward for a son. Abraham Lafleur eventually married a Miss Annie Reed and moved on to Herschel in the Free State, where his wife gave birth to a son. Recalling Stockenstrom's words of many years back, Abraham's heart was, however, full of doubt, and he named the boy Thomas. Not when his second son was born on the 2nd of July 1867, God revealed to Abraham that this was the fulfillment of Stockenstrom's prophecy, and he named the boy after himself, and Stockenstrom. The boy grew up in knowledge and understanding, and astounded many leaders of his day with his great wisdom. At the age of twelve, so the legend reads, he settled a dispute among the Pondos as whether to side with England or Germany, by answering. Not with one or the other. The German queen is the daughter of the Queen of England. If you give to one, you give to the other, and if you send one, you also send the other. They will not give their blood for you and your people. This will become all important in our history. They will not give their blood for you or your people. They will however expect you to give your blood for them and their families. He received his calling from God on the 9th of May, 1889. His father had now moved to Matalili and was the private secretary to Lady Coke, wife of Adam Coke III, who ruled over the Greek was in Kokstad now that Coke was dead. While looking for his father's asses for three days in succession and not being able to find them, he suddenly heard a voice calling out of a stone. Andrew, Andrew, Andrew. I am the Lord God speaking to you, go and gather the dead bones of Adam Coke and call them as one nation, so that they can be my people and I their God. Behold the two asses you are looking for are just on the other side of this hill. Go and tell your father what I command you to do, and tell him that Lady Coke will die at eight o'clock tomorrow morning. These two signs will open the minds of you and your father, so that you will know that it is the Lord who has spoken to you, and that the word of Ezekiel be fulfilled. Andrew found the asses, and a healthy Lady Coke died at eight o'clock sharp on the next morning, the May 10, 1889. The next step in Lafleur's calling was his marriage to Rachel Susanna Koch, the youngest daughter of Adam, Muis, Koch 1v in 1896, who now lies buried at the Griqua Monument in Kranzhoek. After the death of Muis Koch, Lady Koch's successor, the Greek was, now leaderless and in total disarray, chose Lafleur as their leader, who assumed the title of paramount chief. Thus another prophecy was fulfilled. Lefleur, after being chosen as Griqua chief, started collecting the dead bones of Adam Koch. He traveled the length and breadth of the country, many hundreds of miles on foot, reorganizing the strewn Griqua remnants into a new nation, forming treaties with black nations, and trying to convert other colored nations, and trying to convert other colored people to the Griqua cause. The many meeting he held soon led to the authorities branding him as an agitator. He was taken to court in Kokstad, accused of causing an uprising, and subsequently sentenced to 14 years hard labor. He was sent to prison in Cape Town on the May 5, 1898, a mere two years after his wedding day. That night three angels appeared to him in his cell, and said, We are the three angels who appeared to Father Abraham when he was about to offer his son on Moria. Fear not, for we are sent by God to lead the way. This eventually led to him prophesying that he will walk through the prison doors as a free man on Friday, 3 RD April 1903 at exactly 3 o'clock, that is, nine years before his sentence was to expire a prophesy which was fulfilled to the minute. After his release, he was held in even greater esteem than before, and many more lost sheep were brought back to the fold. This time he sent the Griqua message to the corners of the country by means of girls' choirs, who were called ropers. They traveled many miles on foot, with no shelter and nothing to eat. 
They are the unsung yet not forgotten Griqua heroes, many of whom are still living at Kranzhoek and elsewhere, still singing in choirs and working towards Griqua unity. As part of his calling, Le Fleur started organizing great treks from all over the country, and notably Kokstad, Namaqualand, and the Orange Free State, first to the Cape Flats, during which time he founded the Griqua Independent Church of South Africa in the Maitland Town Hall on 6 April 1920, as an offspring of the Griqua National Church in Kokstad, and eventually to Kranchok. Not all Greek was moved to Kranchok, and many of them still form smaller or larger communities in places as far apart as Kimberley and Griqua Town, Kokstad, Namaqualand, and the Cape Peninsula. Lefleur died in a little house adjacent to his tomb on Robberg on July 11, 1941. The Griqua Monument in Kranzhoek was erected September 10, 1942 in honor of de Fleur and other Griqua leaders. It also commemorates the birthday of Le Fleur's wife, Rachel, lovingly remembered as Omiases and honored as Crownmother. Crown Mother. Le Fleur believed his people to be the lost tribe of Israel. For the Greek was of today, Kranz Hoke is their land beyond the River Jordan, Rob Berg their holy mount, and the tomb of Le Fleur their everlasting shrine.